Jane Kilgun, just a little bit about me. I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota. I did child welfare practice for several years, and it was all in permanency planning. I uh, arranged for terminations of parental rights with five children. I came back to school um, to get my PhD because I was so concerned about lack of information about the issues that uh, families and children, about families and children in child welfare. And so the fact that I'm presenting to all of you means a great deal to me. And I am Tina Barr. I'm a PhD candidate in social work at the University of Minnesota. And um, my practice experience is mostly with juveniles who are involved in the juvenile justice system. But I also have experience working with children in foster care, um, children who experience sexual abuse who are foster children, as well as the families who adopted these children. Um, also have some research experience. And my dissertation area is in the um, area of wrongful convictions and exonerations. We social workers have to become more mindful. So I really recommend that social workers consider starting to do some yoga, meditation, uh, at least exercise, spend time in nature, um, anything that can help regulate your brain. Because I know that when I was in practice, it kind of crept up on me. And I think by the time I was in my third, fourth year, I was in a state of dysthymia, which is a kind of a low-grade depression. And uh, I just had a wonderfully positive experience and it made me, that reminded me of my earlier years before I was a social worker, where I realized that I had gone downhill. And so I became, I did start doing mindfulness-based practices like 30 years ago, and I realized that this work was having such an effect on me and affecting my quality of life. And I think you've seen it, and you've seen a lot of people probably leave social work because they can't, they can't deal, with, deal with the terrible trauma that we deal with on a daily basis. It was interesting, when we were searching for information um, specifically for social workers in mindfulness-based practices, it was not so easy to find much out there. It was actually surprising when I looked. It's Are there specific tools or tricks you would, you would suggest that social workers could use, even in, I'm just thinking about the small amount of time that they sometimes are interfacing with young people, whether it's in a school or within a, a facility or other places, to help to kind of build over time? Yes, yeah. I know it, it's hard to believe because we as adults are more resistant probably to mindfulness mm -hmm. exercises than, than children are, um, but uh, kids really do respond to breathing mm -hmm. exercises. A very simple thing to say is, um, uh, both smell the rose and blow out the candle. Just have them sit up straight, mm -hmm. and you sit up straight with them, and you say, smell the rose, so they pull, they breathe through their noses. Hopefully their eyes shut, because I think it works well, but if kids don't want to shut their eyes, they don't have to, nor do you. Smell the rose, and then blow out the candle. And you can do that three or four times, and. That has an amazing effect, just that alone. So if you can develop some sort of uh, a relationship with the parents so that they trust you, then you can ask the parent, would you mind doing you know, a three minute meditation with me? And there are so many three minute meditations on YouTube that you could do, do them with the parent. And so the parent could get a better sense of what it feels like to be in a regulated state and the desirability of being in a regulated state and how important it is to be in a, a regulated state when your kid is dysregulating. Mm -hmm. What's really important for us as professionals is that if we practice mindfulness, that um, what we're trying to do is we're seeking clarity of thought. There's a natural movement for going from seeking clarity of thought, uh, seeking a sense of calmness, then you start doing inner explorations where you look at your inner working models and, and then you let go of all that because you realize that I am not my thoughts and feelings. So the end result really of, of uh, mindfulness-based practices is this capacity to uh, do even deeper, deep, more deeply compassionate service, uh, taking the perspectives of others and then without losing your own. So, applications to practice, is that me?
Okay. We have to be mindful. We have to be attuned to our clients. And we get there through mindfulness practice. We want clients to learn to think about the consequences. In other words, to have good executive function. But we have to think about the consequences. If we're going to work and we feel like crap, we have a responsibility to do some mindfulness-based practices right then and there to let go of all these crappy feelings because we have to be emotionally available to our clients just the way parents must be emotionally available to their children. We have to think of the consequences of our own responses. We cannot indulge ourselves. And I feel crappy and I have a hangover or you know, my husband yelled at me when I got up in the morning. Forget it. You have to do some mindfulness stuff, let go of that, and be available to your clients. Have a clear and regulated mind so you can do your best for your client. We have to think in terms of coming back to ourselves. We have to be attuned to ourselves. Not only do we have to be attuned to clients, we have to be attuned to ourselves. So if we feel that we're going off somewhere that's distancing ourselves from other people, we have to say, I need five minutes. And you need to go somewhere and actually do some meditation, do some of the deep breathing, maybe uh, log on to YouTube and do a three minute relaxation exercise. Often that just involves becoming just aware of our breathing. As I said before, there are studies that show as people become aware of their breathing just for a few minutes, their brain starts to re-regulate and they become more clear and your body feels better. The whole, you know, it's the whole package. Or would you like to, you know, just tell them to get out of your life and leave the kid alone and stop it? You observe all of those things and know that you're feeling that way or you're thinking that and you don't judge yourself. You just say, that's really what it is. And, and what I'm thinking and feeling about this particular client is no judgment about me or my adequacy. It's a normal reaction. So now can I let go of that and think of more practical and effective ways? But that's an example of not judging yourself for whatever you're feeling or thinking about clients. And it's also an example of, of saying, okay, that's how I'm thinking and feeling, but that doesn't define the whole of me. And I also know rationally, because now I have my executive function has come back and I can think, that that's not going to be effective. I would kick that person in the rear end if I thought it was going to work, but it doesn't work. So that, those are the kinds of things you're thinking about as you're meditating on, okay, what do I do when I'm so upset? Or if you let whatever is going on just come to the surface, observe it and say, oh, I'm feeling this way and I'm feeling that way and I'd like to do this and I'd like to do that. And if I did this, what would happen? If I did that, what would happen? And you practice your breathing. Complex trauma leads to dysregulation. Dysregulation is a state where your executive function goes out the door and you, temp you, you tend not to think well for mind. Our clients tend not to have this history of secure attachments that we have, so they tend to be antisocial, self-destructive, or inappropriate. And so mindfulness-based practices is really a shortcut to helping people get back in touch with their executive skills to calm down, uh, to re-regulate, and then act in a way that's not harmful to themselves or others.